set strategy for all of us as students and teachers. I personally always look forward to listening to Dr. Sumita for a variety of reasons. I'm sure you would also enjoy it, you would also be benefited by it. Uh, Professor Gupta was our teacher at GNU. Uh, currently, he is National Fellow at uh, National uh, uh, University of Educational Planning and Administration. And uh, besides, he also does several caps. Uh, so, uh, his uh, intellectual uh, trajectory in terms of his publications is uh, far and wide, and therefore. Uh, not so easy for me to recount uh, in this short time, but I can certainly tell you that uh, in addition to the textbook which all uh, students in the university read, and in addition to some of those very prominent literature on political sociology in India, we all read, uh, we utilize for our uh, intellectual advancement. Uh, I'm sure some of those things will be reflected again in today's lecture. Now I request uh, Professor uh, Chanda, the President of our University, to chair the session and uh, start the proceeding. Thank you. My very esteemed friend and colleague, and in a genuine sense, teacher, their other colleagues and my many, many, very, very dear students. Every company academics does have some academic claims. But I think the claim they generally belong to rather the Panta Gupta. We are really no match to what he has been able to accumulate in his name over the period of time. We have been fortunately together at the Allah Nehru University for many years. And during those years, it was just a very open, very, very academic and stimulating atmosphere in which we used to meet. As most of you know, I am a student of economics. A very every student of economics used to be confronted with an outstanding sociologist whose game it was always. You can guess that. The Bunker has been one of those rare minds who would think atypically, atypically, who would argue most candidly and tell the reason that he cultivated tremendous respect not only in the academic circle but I believe in the wider social context also. In his writings, I am sure as students of sociology, you will have reason to well upon, you will have reason to fall back upon, make use of this, learn from them, try to argue the different situation, arguments, relationships, etc., etc. But one thing that I would like to particularly mention about whether the Bhakar Gupta, again is my understanding. Unlike many other sociologists and many other economists and not also many geographers, he will not leave the argument without bringing it to its logical end. There are many of us who would throw up the idea without providing satisfactory explanation or deeper insights into that. And they need it for the reader to guess and make out. But he is the one who would not only espouse a particular issue, a cause, but also try to take his own reasoned argument for or again and ultimately take you to a very, very cogent set of reasons for or against for I don't know whether he will categorize himself as a rebel in sociology, but I think it's a rebellion of ideas, of arguments, of understanding. And that has been his forte all along. And I'm extremely happy to you. 
I will not say here is food to you, but very happy that you could catch Buddha in Bangkok. During our, I think, 20 year association at JNU, I could actually catch Buddha for you. You have been lucky enough to catch Buddha for so soon. Perhaps under the auspices of South Asian University, that might have appeared to him. And I told him just by a book that we have a unique combination of students from all the age countries. I think in your club, there must be at least one or two students from every country. I don't know whether from Maldives, I don't know from Maldives, Bhutan, we may not have. But to have students from six countries is in today's time a Herculean task itself. If I'm from them, when we go back from South Asian University, please keep this in mind that we do are doing a good job in bringing together young, inquiring mind. And it's for you, how do you put fresh thinking into your mind? You are going to listen to a lecture of very, very topical importance. Where is this month? Slums are now a brain of urban life, urban management, and the story goes much deeper than sociological issues and ramifications. I'm sure he will dwell into many of those issues from your perspective, but I as a student of economics would certainly like to catch it on further for my own interest, and all of us, I'm sure all of us are looking forward to a lecture of erudition. Thank you very much, Professor Gupta. I am only to seek your forgiveness. I will not be able to stay till the end of the lecture for obvious reasons. Thank you very much.
I was beside there were two well known academics, and they talked about the town of West India again. And that there was such a large number of habitats and neighbors and so forth, which was creating much of a problem in the province. And unless one was able to get a handle on that, one wouldn't quite understand the nature of conflict in the West UP. When I listened to what they were saying, it occurred to me that perhaps I'd been to a completely different place. Because the, the situation that they were describing was not at all what I had seen. I had hardly seen any agricultural cultivators. I had seen small owner proprietors, very few agricultural laborers. So where did the agricultural laborers come from? 43% of them are a special price. And so when I asked them the question, they said that uh, this is all census figures. Well, I began to suspect the census figures right away. And I went and did a door to door census myself of three villages, which were also listed in the district census handbook. And I found that our figures were not the same at all, not even close, but 43 to 44 percent discrepancy. So then I went to the block developer officer under whose ages much of this is done, and we sat down together and said, How did this happen? And then I discovered there were probably two issues at stake. One was that perhaps the enumerator spent more time than he should have in the block development officer's room. And number two, he probably made a simple mistake, which all enumerators are warned against in the training program, and that is not to conflate those who have no land with agricultural laborers. I think they may have made that mistake. So from then onwards, I'm very careful about how I handle uh, large scale censuses or large scale macro data. And my own judgment has been that you must apply the smell check. You want the spell check, this is a smell check. But unless the data smells right, there's something wrong about it. And in my view, there is no point in looking at macro data or figures in census and national sample survey if you have, do not have an independent assessment of what is going on. And that independent assessment can only come if you have a problem, if you have a question to ask, and more importantly, if you've been there yourself and seen the field. Unless you do that, you cannot simply go and sit down and say, here are the numbers that they are on the doesn't work like that way. Which is why my initial opposite of, or we would say hostility to what was said by my colleagues in the university was primarily because I was uh, aware of the fact that this just couldn't be true. I didn't see any agricultural uh, neighbors like the ones that they were mentioned. Where did they disappear? How did I not see them? Of course, there's a possibility that I may have made a mistake, which is why I thought of doing it myself, door to door. Three minutes, which I couldn't really more than that, and that took me a long time anyway. But I was completely confident of my data. I also realized that very often I use the wrong terms. For example, I spent about a year and a half of my field work, I wasted about a year and a half of my field work because I used the wrong term. I asked the question, Do you have a knockery? And most of them said no. And I couldn't believe it. Why are they saying no? I just couldn't understand it. Because when I asked them, what do you do, they said, we are farmers. When I asked them at the end of the day, what did you do, not what you do, but what did you do, then they say all kinds of things, like we were earth movers, we pulled a rickshaw, I was a carpenter, part-time mason. And I said, but hold it, you said you were a farmer, didn't you? They said, yeah, I'm a farmer. So I did farm, so I did farm. So then I discovered that the reason why he said he was a farmer, because farming was the only job he really, really knew. Something about. He knew a lot about it. He could read the winds, he could read the clouds, he could read the soil, he could read the water, the humidity in the soil, what kind of seeds should be, you know, uh, so at what time. Uh, the whole works. He knew all of that, but he didn't really farm full time. And when I asked him what normally, I made a mistake. I should have asked him what Masduri. Because Masduri is what they do, which is, you know, paid by the hour or by the day, you know, never even by the week. So normally something to look forward to, and must be something that they get most of the time. And that terminological distinction was very, very important, which I didn't pay attention to, on account of which I did really lousy job. <clears throat> and therefore, when people say, as most people do, 
that 68% of India lives in villages and therefore their agriculture and agriculture is the main source of the livelihood or is the backbone of the sustenance, I begin to suspect, can this really be true? And with this in mind, I look for other things, other macro data, other survey figures, which can, in some ways, strengthen my position because I'm applying the spell check. Now, why do you think I want to look at macro data? What's the big deal? I mean, I've been, I've done my field work, I've done my study, I've done this uh, survey of the kind. Why do I want this other kind of data at all? I want it because I think that it makes my arguments more persuasive. If I'm able to show that these things are also there in another realm, another data bank, and this is not at all with what I'm saying, and this is a picture that is magnified, and if I look at it at your time, then what I am trying to explore and to explain becomes that much more easier to convince. Because at the end of the day, whatever knowledge you are pursuing has to be pervaded. You have to convey the message. And the best way to convey the message is to seek the ground where there is least resistance. And I think your points of view will be accepted better if you are able to use as much as is available in the public realm to your advantage. But I must tell you, because all this is so idiosyncratic, therefore there are times when I don't trust the data I see in many of the surveys, and therefore I quite calmly ignore something I think my dear friend who is a child of the cast, but that's what I often do. And this is not good practice, I know, but that is my practice. And that is what I want to convey to you. So, methodologically, I think you must first start, and that is where I think as a sociologist you can make a difference, because there's no point in, in plowing the same ground, you know, or being uh, you know, active in the same area that others have already done a good job on. Your contribution as a sociologist is because you bring a certain degree of sensitivity to the field, not simply because of your emotion or, or attachment, but because you're seeing things in the ground with your own eyes, and yet you are testing them. You're testing them, and another way of testing them is to see what have other people done? What kind of surveys are available? Can I use them to my advantage? Can I learn something from them? Is there a trick I forgot all about? So this is the way in which there should be a relationship between qualitative and qualitative data. Or very often I have heard this about qualitative data being supreme or qualitative data being supreme. But I think a good social scientist is that social scientist who puts the two together. This is how I think it should be done, but you can devise your own method any way you want. But that's one story. The other story is that for almost seven or eight years I spent a fairly productive period in the corporate sector. Uh, in the business world. And I learned a few things because I audited a large number of small and medium large sized companies, some large as well. And in the process of auditing those companies, I realized that a lot of informal labels that work in our country, far more than I had imagined. Of course, one brief stated that 93% of the workforce is informal. That figure is there, is often uh, you know, brought out and uh, people throw up their hands and despair. But to go to regular factories and see informal labor, casual labor, contract labor, the labor break, different things, but just that they're not actually formal labor, was something I wasn't really prepared for. The extent to which this informal labor in this country. Nor was I prepared for the fact that behind this very swishy exterior, the manicured lawns, the cars, the big sedans outside, the fact that the owner is a person of, well, some substance has been educated abroad as well. Behind all of this lies the reality that most of these people depend on informal labor to make their profits and indeed to make products to make uh, the producer uh, have a competitive edge to the world market. This is another thing that I saw, which made me really look at certain issues that I have not heard examined with any degree of diligence, shall we say. So the export earnings that we hear about, that again was an alarm bell, because I felt that export earnings were not really as rosy a story, didn't really look as good as I thought they, they would look. 
But once I saw the thing from inside, I realized there was a lot of informal labor, a lot of things that we don't really know too much about. And the fact of the matter was that we didn't really specialize in high skill labor or in products that demanded high skill labor. Now, strangely enough, my study of village India and my auditing experience, this is an auditor in the financial world, in the uh, business world, came together quite, uh, quite productively, or so I believe. My, in fact, my first breakthrough when I began to look at agriculture and villages rather differently, and uh, began to question the role of village studies in sociology and anthropology. Uh, I must say, and it's not because some people are present here, but there's an article that Professor Chatta wrote uh, years ago, uh, which is called, I think, The White the Elephant and the Dragon, uh, in which he discussed rural non farm employment. Uh, I've said this before on another occasion, I, I think he was present, I think there was some Japanese there at that time. But it is true, it's a fact, that when I read that piece and I read about rural non farm employment, uh, it dropped. You know, and I realized that this is exactly what I wanted to know. But nobody in sociology talked about this. We never discussed the work now from employment with any degree of sense of seriousness. All we did do was to say, well, village X in the year dot had so many scooters, rickshaws, so televisions, and radios, and bicycles, and that same village X in the year T2 has so many more X, Y, and Z. You know? Well, that's okay. But it led to the impression that at the end of the day, agriculture was still the mainstay of the village economy. And when I read about rural non farm employment from sources outside of the usual uh, texts uh, in sociology, I felt that this was something that we should be looking into and look into very closely. So, this is what I began to then explore, and I did a few uh, village studies concentrating specifically on non farm employment. And was I in for a surprise? Such a large number of people were in the village, lived in the village, full time in the village, and didn't do anything agriculture. Which led me back to my earlier feedback when I used to ask people, What do you do for a living? And they said, Farmer. And then when I asked them later on, What did you do? They did everything else but farming. And when I read about rural non farm employment and the figures that we provided, for example, I think it was in the said as well, itself, that 45.5% of rural net domestic product was not agriculture, which basically means that roughly half of the rural economy was already agriculture. So if you go down this line and you are faithful to your initial observation, then a world opens up which would have otherwise, I think, been out of my reach. So for that reason, I am grateful to last scale macro figures because I took it on this particular instance at least it confirmed the opinion that I had, and this opinion should have been known to me, I and mean, this point should have been known to me much earlier, but because of the group I was in, we didn't discuss other kind of literature. But if you have a problem, and when you have a problem, you do look across literature, across disciplines. So when you talk about interdisciplinary, it's not because you want to achieve the lowest common denominator. Interdisciplinary does best when you reach for the stars. You say, I have a problem here. Let me see in sociology or in economics or in history, let me see who else can help me sort it out so that I can be a better historian, a better sociologist, a better economist, not a better interdisciplinary. I think that is how I believe our discipline should be passed. At least I have, uh, I have benefited a lot. For example, now we have a rural manufacturing account has you know, grown from 27 to 5%. All of the share employment has fallen from 78 to 68 percent These are things that don't begin to make sense to me because I'm looking at the rural world from a non-farm optic. And from a non-farm optic, I see all these things you know, really hiding up in front of my eyes. And I also understand now why people who really laughed and scoffed me when I went to the villages in the late 70s and the early 80s, actually I began my serious village studies in the 80s, from the 70s. And as early as 80s, for some of you were born, but even in the 80s, which for me is historical time, not yet archaeological time, 
Even the 80s, I had met people in villages, those who were relatively prosperous. They used to make fun of me. For example, I remember Mahindra Singh Jakarat in a best UP, you may have heard of him. Mahindra Singh Jakarat had nothing but scorn in the I met him. And he made it known that he thought very poorly of me. He said, look at you, scaly, you know, uh, concave, chested, uh, look at your hands, look at my hands, you know? look how big and strong I am, look how skinny you are, you take it small, you city people are no good. And indeed, I should feel very, very you know, uh, humiliated because he used to make it a point of repetition. But in five or six short years, the same man came to me and wanted me to help me help him get his sons a job in her village. In five or six years, the story had changed for dramatically. And I still remember the time where he used to sit with this gang of people, say things in a particular dialect he didn't understand. Everybody laughed his finger, and I would feel like sitting shrinking to the ground. And he used to get immense happiness from this, this stuff which I found. The same man comes to me and says, he's lost his touch, he's lost his man rod, erect, daring, and now he comes to me in a semi supine position, Asking me if I would help his sons. Why? He's a big short farmer. He's not a so tall. You see, the urban world made him a big, big farmer, but he was 15 acres. 15 acres was fine, but his three boys grew big and they were married. It wasn't fine any longer. And he wanted these boys to get a job somewhere else. Of course, to work as an agricultural neighbor in that particular area would be infantic. And how would you show your face? So the best thing is to leave the village, go to the city, find a job. Perhaps this pigeon chested, uh, weak, uh, small hand, small arm, weak arm person might be of some use. So that is how the world changed. And when you look at the, look at the farming and the constraints in which they, they work in the villages, it's not at all surprising that their attitude should undergo such a modification. As you know, perhaps, that 63% of holdings in our country are below one hectare. You know, that is, you know, it's awful. And with, uh, with land with the best size, if you have two sons, you already have two sons too many. You're looking for an outlet for them. Where can they go? So when you have land holders of that size, it's obvious that you have more than enough people at home. Your know, family farm isn't such a great thing after all. And that you hardly require agricultural labor or any kind of job. You hardly require agricultural labor. Right? Now and then. If you're, for example, producing sugar cane, then you can manage it. But if it's wheat or something like that, you need labor for a very short period of time, and that's about it. And then you go back to whatever you have in terms of family. So the average holding is very small. The number of people who are marginal farmers is going up quite a bit. You know, from 50% just about 25 years back, it has cut 63% and more. And these are all you know, general figures which you know, are going to be absolutely accurate. But they take the general trend, and this is the trend that agrees with my statute. This is exactly what I see in the field. I've seen the fact that people's lands are getting smaller and smaller, only getting smaller and smaller. Now, when the Zamindari Abolition Act happened, and when the Zamindari was abolished and lands were put in, of course, in the 60s and 70s, we were already upset that it was not being implemented properly, and people were taking advantage of the various loopholes in the Act. And uh, they were transferring land to fictitious people and all that stuff. Now, what what land reforms could not do, and what the anti zamindari Abolition Act could not do, demography and population size is tight. They are tight. Because together, the subdivision of holdings, you rarely, rarely find a big farmer today. So, when I went to the villages in the first time in the 80s, I went with all that literature in my head. Of the big farmers, landlords, landlord, agricultural labor confrontations. I've seen a couple of Hindi movies also where the landlord usually rides a horse, rich people, and the awful things. And one in where are they? Where have they gone? And these books were written by important people, senior people, these renowned people, but I just didn't see that kind of thing on the ground. Till from 1993 till about 2001, I used to teach a course called Peasant Anthropology. I stopped teaching it because I felt that the books I was teaching out of were irrelevant. It wouldn't work anymore. I don't know if you were there at the student at that time or not. But what I then did, I stopped teaching that course and I 
a vision for the six or seven years, or maybe a little longer, till I was able to make a vision package of the material collected on diverse sources, and then began to teach the course again. I taught it for a few short years and several years to go. But the fact is, that kind of landlord that I've seen is nowhere in the picture. And if you look at the statistics also, it agrees with me. Yeah, there were about 11 percent to 11.8 percent of our big land, big landowners earlier. Now it's hardly 0.8 percent, which is fine. 30 percent of land was controlled by the once upon a time. Now it's 11.2 percent. Fine. It just falls in place. Those big farmers, big landowners, are really a rarity. They are a few. You can find one or two here and there, but they're not as if they dominate the scene like they used to. Now, if they do not dominate the scene, then who dominates the scene? That's a big question. Does anybody dominate at all? That's the question which I'll ask each one. But the fact of the matter is that the bulk of those who have land in rural India have very little land. Very, very little land. For which reason, agriculture is not what it was cut out to be. People don't want to stay in agriculture anymore. They want to exit agriculture as fast as they can. Of course, they cannot do it easily. But if the chance ever comes the way, they are ready to up and leave. For several years I did, I worked in East UP, Madhuri, Jonpur, Mirzapur, Vijayanar, and Nalas, where carpet belt is, and we carpets over there. And, um, the, and when I stood toward those areas, I, in many ways, I rarely found able bodied adult men. There were some, but very few. Most of them had taken the convenient train that leaves from that region. Allahabad is not too far away either. And they said the Bombay, Wafi, Surat, nowadays even Tirupur, in Kwaimati, in Tamil Nadu, or to Panipat, or to Kishanganj, in Bengal. So they were traveling everywhere. But most of them would go to West India. West India was a magnet. And uh, I saw this village after village, and I said to myself, well, so it is, after leaving. Till I came to two villages, three villages, and in three villages I found these men there, you know, these big, men, unshaven, standing there. I said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, we live there. So why do we live there? Why don't we go to Bombay or Surat? He said, we, we, are, we are farmers. Now, by this time, I'm smart. I know they cannot be farmers. They must be something else also. So I tell them, yes, I've heard about that. But what else are you? And then they tell me, we are carpet weavers. So I said, okay, we are carpet weavers. So when did you learn to weave carpets? Well, when we were 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. Obviously, they were inducted on carpet weaving as child laborers years and years ago. Who taught you to weave carpets? My father. Uh, how long did it take you? About a uh, month and a half, two months. Because the carpets the weave were there are not your very highly refined silk, Kashmiri carpets, or Persian carpets. They are the kind of carpets that are bought by IKEA, by Macy's, in these department stores. They are sold in the nursery. They're they not very good looking carpets. Not very, they're rough and ready. Why did your father teach you to weave carpets? Because agriculture is uncertain, uncertain in there. And therefore there is uh, no harm in having a second string to your bow. That's why the father taught us to weave carpets. Good. Then I asked a question which turned out to be a killer question. But I had no idea it was going to be a killer question. I thought it was a very simple question, logical question, the next day. And I asked them, well, have you taught your boys to weave carpets? And he was believing me, in all three villages, 100% of them said, no. We will not teach our children to be carpets. Look, wait, has got us in this hole. We don't want them to be here. And what are the boys doing? Do you think the boys are doing mathematics and English and geography? No. They were hands in their pockets, they were taking stones, but they may not be carpets. That's not, no, no. And they're all waiting, they're peering over the part wall, sometimes walking over it hoping that there is some sign, some signal, some wavelength from somewhere that will take them to some slum, some city, some workshop, somewhere in the neighborhood or in a distant land like Bombay, Bapi, Surat, there. This is what they may really want. This is where they want to go. And it so happens that in these three villages, most of the men, for some reason, didn't have the contact, didn't have the network, and therefore could not go. Now, when I look at the slums of Bombay, for example, I spent many years in Bombay because I did some work there, the first round of what was in Bombay. I remember a large number of slums who were kind of cordoned off in terms of caste and sometimes religion. And it was always a bit of a surprise to me because I speak to myself, here I'm in Bombay, and yet these issues are so important in the, in the 
the slums. What I didn't realize then was that the reason why caste and village were so important in terms of locking out neighborhoods and slums, very much like our animals out of their territory, was because there was a network that brought people from wherever to work. So if I have a cousin or I have a brother or somebody else, I bring that person once I have a job, and then the network slowly grows in shape and size, and it acts as a social buffer against the vicissitudes of the urban world. But that is why we have a natural collaboration of kin, clan, and neighborhood in slums. Now what I see is very interesting. I find in the same areas, because the kin, clan, neighborhood doesn't work any longer like it used to in the past, there's a large number of people now who come to the slums because they were born there by neighbors, by friends, not necessarily from their family or their caste. So a large number of people now are going to distant places because signal was beamed to them, not from their family member, but from a friend. In fact, if you go to the villages today, I used to see that in Maharashtra in the areas of Alma, South East Maharashtra, I don't remember that in places like that. But even today, if you go to East Uyghur, we're supposed to be back over here. You go to a tea shop in an East Uyghur village, you'll be surprised how many friends are sitting there. Early in village India, when I, even in the 80s, people rarely went to their friends for a cup of tea. They went to the cousin, they went to the aunt, they went to the uncle, there was no such thing called friend in a village. And now, increasingly, I find friendships developing in the village. And friendship is really important in sociology because friendship demonstrates freedom. Because you can choose your friends. You know? And this is why friendship is always something which is coterminous with modernity. You did not have friendships in traditional societies anywhere in the world. At least not with the depth and veracity with which you have friendships in contemporary times. So you now have a set of people who are living in the village, not very happy, have a foot in the village, but eager to have the other foot far, far away from the village. At the same time, they don't want to leave the village entirely. So they hang on to their handkerchief sized plots. Why is that so? Because they, after all is said and done, that is the only social insurance they have. They have nothing else. So they can't get rid of that land. The land is very important. And given the kind of land laws we have in the country, they can't leave the land and give it to somebody else's contract farming because it's very, very dangerous. So they all have somebody in the house who looks after them. The property. It could be the youngest child, who is often put through school by the brothers who are working elsewhere, or the idiot brother, who could go in any way, or, as in most cases, the older, old, aged parents. So you look at the Manbar profile, you'll find that on average, 43% of people are cultivators in the villages. Fine. Now, because you're spell check, you see, you've seen so many old people in the village, you've seen so many old people who live by themselves, you do that, you keep looking. And lo and behold, the fact is there. 60 plus in the villages. Cultivated percentage goes up to 64, 63 point something. So a large number of elderly people are staying back in the villages and work. If you look at the age dependency ratio again, you find rural India much higher than urban India. Why? Because almost everyone in the village is doing some job, is working. And it's not as if they are young people. A large number of young people are there, leaving many of the older people behind who are not just sitting on the haunches or waiting for things to come from the children, but actually working themselves. This is also like another development that is important for sociologists, and that is because the men are away, in this Indian period, by default, many women have become head of households. It's not because of, because of feminism or because of any kind of activism, it's just a blank space they have to fill. And as they fill the blank, blank space, you know, with experience, they begin to get ideas in their heads. They begin to think about stressing for better schools, better medical care, better irrigation canals and systems. All those things were as a follow-up of the fact that now, for reasons outside their control, for reasons that they had not conspired to bring about, they are now heads of families. And that is why they are going to take interest in these issues. When I did this the survey of people, in villages, and I ask men, what do you want? They say, you know, if you get a factory in the neighborhood, you could all get a job, you know, you're much better off. When you ask women, what do you want? The answer in many ways, not always, in many ways, give us a better school, 
Because women are thinking future, thinking of the children. Give us a better story. But the sword, and I said to myself, look how different men are from women. Fathers are from mothers. Fathers are thinking of today. I need a job. I need something. The mother is thinking of the child tomorrow. And this endless education, believe me, to a large extent, not saying entirely, to a large extent is because of this kind of change in the household pattern in many homes in Malaysia. And this change is a very important one. But if you look at the, of the migration figures, you find that the large number of people also go migrate from village to village. In fact, till very recently, the migrants from village to village was almost uh, 50% of the migrants. Now, this time around has fallen to 28%. But this time another thing, another thing has fallen, that is, well, not fallen, but the rise of migrants from rural to urban has not been that much. You know? The last sentence was 24%, now they will take 27%. If someone doesn't agree with my stench, something is wrong, I don't know what it is. I would have imagined many more people, you know, would have been left the village. But there could be other explanations for it. But in the meantime, let's stop and just observe the state. The village to village migration, the rural to rural migration, is not something to be sneezed at. It is really quite impressive. It was not 28%, but it was 50%. It may go up again. Where are they going? Why are they leaving the village to run the village for us? You know? Don't they have enough of one village? The reason they're going is they're going for a job which is not agriculture. That is what's happening. So when I look at the other way, John Paul Mirza, etc., etc., et and see these people sitting in the carpet rooms and making carpets in the dead of night with a lantern, I find many of them don't live in that village or don't come from that village. They come from somewhere else and they come to work in that village. With that village, that room is part of a network through contractors to the cell, to the buyer, to the living room in Stockholm. You know, this is the connection. When you talk about globalization, is really, really, really gone down to the depths of village in this fashion. And therefore, you have people who are going all the way up this land. Now, when you think of this, you look for figures, and of course you find them. Because if you look at, again, the number of rural establishments which are non-agricultural, you find the number of rural establishments non agriculture in the manpower centers is taken from national samples, surveys, and so on. You'll find that roughly the same number of rural establishments that are non agriculture exist in villages and cities, especially when the number of people employed is below 10. Above 10, cities take over. But if the number of people employed is below 10, and most of the uh, enterprises are small, you just start with maybe panel making, lab, other you know, things like that, really. They're small units, and they employ the most people, by the way, the units are smaller themselves. You find the village in urban India more or less the same. But if you take a look at the census figures, the census figure is a category called census houses and the uses to which they are put. Now, this is a very interesting category because it's a proxy. The other thing by looking at this, you find that the number of houses that are put to use as workshops, worksheds, is very high in rural India. The National Sample Survey in Manpower Study says rural India is a little below urban India. The census figures say rural India is above India in terms of workshops, workshops in villages. It also says, interestingly enough, that a large number of men work in this household industries. It's not something that women do alone, it's not for paying money. So men work in it, and it's actually a main job, the main earners, the main workers, they work in these places. So, but in certain parts of the country, another very interesting feature, the more backward a region, the greater the number of workshop workshops and the greater the number of men working in them, greater the proportion of men working in them. So in backward areas like Bihar, Chhattisgarh, you, know, you find Madhya Pradesh, you'll find many more men working in these units than women proportionately than you'll find in advanced areas, say Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Papaja. Okay? So what is happening is that these men are looking for jobs wherever they can. Because the village is no longer sustaining them, therefore they like to go anywhere they can. And the reasons for migration are also very interesting. About 38% of the reason for migration is in search of a better job. Even to even the 2011 census, it was about 37%. It was 38 in 2001. Again, I'm not very happy with the fact that it's fallen by 1%. I can't imagine why. Because in my view, if you put all the other figures together, 
this morning as us sitting there, right, as far as I'm concerned, something wrong over there. But what is good is that the number of small downs is really shot up. You know, has really grown, grown enormously. Though the overall urbanization rate has gone down, overall urbanization rate does not mean that people are numbers are reducing. It's interesting that today we have 18 million class 1 cities. No, million plus cities. 18 new million plus cities. You have 72 new, brand new, in two censuses, 72 new uh, class 1 cities. And about 2,800 new towns. Which is a little more than the new villages have come. Which is why rural population has increased by 19 7 million and urban population is more than 91 million. The rural population grown by 13 percent, urban population by 31 percent. So urban India is really pulsating. But what kind of pulse, well, pulse is, 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 is there that beats in the hearts of urban Indians? Most of the who come to work in urban India are not highly trained people. In fact, most of the will tell you that there is daily a bomb you about to be aware of. One thing is in common that they are lowly skilled people, even though some of them are educated. Today, 57% of those who are unskilled laborers in our country have a school or high school degree. You see, so they're actually educated people. The number of people in the workforce today who are graduates has gone down slightly in 2004, 5 and now by 2%. I don't know why that has happened, but there are graduates also in the workforce who cannot do anything better than working as simple laborers. So there is no job for them at a higher end. So though they are educated, it's not good enough. The life of the Indian temple, after all this education, is a flickering one. Is there today or tomorrow? So all of them are actually vying against each other to get that contract job, which is the best they can do. Because most of the people are in contract labor. How do, how do you know this? Well, I've seen this when I was a kid, when I was an auditor. But I've given two facts, and then again, there's a wonderful report written by the late Professor Rajun Sengupta, whom we all know do so well, a wonderful man. And in his report, which is the National Commission on, on Unorganized Labor, he shows from figures from National Sanders, particularly, that 37.8% of the production of the former sector was through informal labor. And that grew in 1999 to 2004 from 37.8% to 46.6%. It grew in fact. So, in the high moon of liberalization and economic development and growth, what was really happening was that informal content of was increasing in the formal workforce, in the formal sector. So, if you think you bought a car, a Maruti car, and it's a formal sector production, think again. Because the large part of it is the informal sector. Maruti's own website. Did what was happening, says that said that 85% of their workforce was contract labor. And I think that is probably an understatement because when I used to go to audit, I remember very nice place, wonderful high walls, beautiful building. The moment we enter, the rear gates would open and people would run. You know, because they were all casual, informal laborers that had not been put on the roads and they didn't want us to report on them. So that we should go to go to audit, then after we learned about this. I used to station young, agile, nimble auditors in all the exit gates. So we entered the main gate, they turned from those gates, and these auditors would catch them, interview them, photograph them, and that's how we used to get all the documentary evidence needed for our purpose. So the kind of labor that is being thrown out of the village, though they try hard to educate, now you know 93% of all applications have a primary school, but that doesn't seem to be much good. We can discuss education later. But the fact is that we are all mesmerized by the IT industry, which only employs about 2 million people. And this is by the confession of NASCOM. I'm not looking at NASCOM says that we have roughly 2 million people who are employed in the ITES, as IT and IT enabled sector. Of course, the contribution of the IT sector from less than 1% percent now roughly 7%, so a huge jump in terms of GDP. But number of people employed still is very, very low. Where are people getting jobs? They don't really enjoy the homes, they really enjoy the as beauty makers, bangle makers, carpet weavers, etc., etc. And that is where we are doing very, very well. 18% in 2007 8 of the world's trade in carpet came from that place in East UP. Can you imagine? 18%. 18% of 
80% of gems and jewelry from India. So India was doing well where in areas where you didn't really need high skill labor. Tirupur, if you heard of Tirupur in, in Tamil Nadu district, Tirupur is the first university capital to make your best and so forth Tirupur. In Tirupur, today, if you go there, I mean, it's amazing. It is served by six ports. It doesn't do any cotton. There's no cotton in that region. I did a study of six cotton districts in India. Nothing happens in terms of cotton over there. But Tirupur is there because there are six ports supplying cotton to Tirupur. And Tirupur has laborers from all over the country. And they're all very happy to be there as contract laborers. And they come from far away. There was a time, very recently, in 1999, 2012, when I hardly found any labor from North India going to South India. But in 2002 onwards, I saw labels everywhere in Tirupur, you know, from Kishanganj, from Panipat, from everywhere, from Bihar, Jharkhand, whole clutch of Jharkhand is in Tirupur. And that shows that the barriers are broken, people are doing wherever there is a job. And the contract labor system is a very, very efficient system for the contract that goes out. The contract is a long arm. It's a long arm. And the contract can reach out wherever. And these people are coming from, from distant places to these, uh, to these units. Which is why small towns today are developing very rapidly. See, earlier number of, of, of uh, urbanization, we only talk about Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, and stuff like that. We talk about them today, you'll be fairly behind times. Because, as you know, the growth rate in Delhi has come down from the mid 50s to 86%, Bombay has come up to 5%, or 13% last time. And if you look at Bombay City and Delhi City, you see that Bombay City itself is a negative growth rate. And that's fine. But there are other small towns in the neighborhood, or Bombay and Delhi, which are going very, very rapidly. And for example, Noida is 110%, Bhutan is fantastic, 110%, Bhutan is 73%. You have places like Delhi is 64%, you have Delhi, Bombay, 120%, you have a place called Loni, you have 220%. Huge things. You know, to prove that having these small towns are really, very really interesting. But why small towns? Why isn't it happening in big towns? Why are small towns, many small towns, remaining inactive? Why, why, why? Because small town is important today as real estate costs are lower and therefore people rather go there than putting so much money in Delhi or Bombay. Because now with IT, you don't need ancillary industries next door, you don't need bank next door. You don't need to walk across to the bank to cash a check. Everything can be done through the internet. So you don't need those kind of services. What do you need? You need cheap land, you need cheap labor, work in Delhi in a small town and then to transport your goods you have a truck that will take you over rock and, uh, rocky territory who cares, this commodity is going there, I'm not going there there's a man called Sanjay Bhadava who is on this called Manipur, Manipur will never know this it's a place that requires a GPS to spot it is a, about 100 miles from another difficult place to spot which is a school up I shouldn't say that, it's a university department and this man Sanjay Gurdav has 112 cars and he has a problem every morning because he doesn't know which car to take. And because he's in this dilemma, he usually takes his helicopter to work. Now, this is the kind of money you have in small towns. 20% of India's billionaires, billionaires come from small towns. Small towns are the action is Sanjay Gurdav is what Nafisa Reggae is about. There are many such people who are very, very wealthy. And all are small town people and they make a killing there. Why? Because you see, the kind of work you need, the workers require, does not demand skilled labor. And therefore, if you are asking yourself, where is the action happening in terms of economic entrepreneurship, such as it is? You will find the economic entrepreneurship, you will spot where it is happening by looking at where the slums are going badly. Where the slums are going badly, that is where economic activity is happening. For example, Surat. 1983 to 1992, the slum growth was double the population of the growth in Sudan city. But look at Pune. Pune from 1993 to 2007, you know what the growth of slums was? 176% growth of slum population. And you go to Pune now, it is at all look at the Pune that used to be in the 70s. There's no family resemblance. It's a totally different place. Because that is where the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs are coming, and with them, come these laborers from different parts of the country and they all send in slums. So if you want to have a quick way of checking out where is economic activity happening, find out where are the slums because that is something that is available to us quite easily. So what you see, you see all of these developments happening, you have the villages are 
20 odd people, you find urban India is absorbing them to a certain extent. But what kind of absorption, what kind of people, what kind of industries, the kind of thing that's going on in urban India, even in small towns, do not require high level of labor, which is why you have a large slum population. And of course, with all that, we must remember that education is something that most people are really, really doing their best to obtain. But it's not getting the way of the get. But there is still time, I suppose. There is a demographic danger that might pay off. You see, in 1980, 2% of Indian kids went to private schools. 2%. Today, I've got the Human Development Report. In village India, 21% go to private schools. In urban India, 52% go to private schools. I have seen a family, two families, you might say, what is two families? But I saw, I've seen two families who are actually really, honestly, below poverty line who send their boys, two boys, to a private school. So it's not a private school you and I imagine. It's a different kind of thing. But it's a private school that they pay money. So they're hoping that the children will somehow get them the requisite education to somehow leave this village behind and take off. Which is why the village is getting increasingly hollow with time and the slums are looking increasingly hopeful. There are many other things that need to be done that we 
level for the improvement in education to very good. We need not go as far as graduation level to look into another paper of mine. It's clearly for that. By international standard, if you die out of my work for between educated and non educated. Who is educated? Anybody who has gone to secondary level schooling and above is classified as educated worker internationally. In rural India today, only 10% of the people of the workers can be classified as educated. And if you also do the male female diagnosis, however, only 4% of female workers in rural India can be classified even in the year 9, 2009 and 10. You can imagine that India has achieved many strides. So there are so many dimensions, so many issues which should attract the exceptional socialists also. You have given them everything. I don't know whether you need to be put strictly under the heading of socialism. I think you are a little bit particular. You are economic socialists of social economists, I don't know. But there are so many issues, problems, questions which are interpreted. And I wish I could also be a young lecturer again, Professor Sarela, a dean of the school. So sometime invite me to come and and again a conversation with the young social media. I have to go for another meeting and have a good time with you. Folks, no, uh, I apologize for coming late. <clears throat> this was not my intention to be This is just something that uh, we didn't know much about. I don't know much about India. Maybe this was something we to Anyway, if you have any questions, I'm very supposed to talk now. Sir. Do you think that car parts manufacturing is highly skilled? Forget it. 
you go to any major car parks manufacturing India, in Italy, it goes to Germany or to China, increasingly China, to buy machines. And the machines are so good that you have to be a really imaginative person to make a mistake. The machines are foolproof. So you just need a few months training as an apprentice and you're going to be put to work. So this is why I think that the attraction of a, a quick buck, you know, is what has led the side down. We have not taken advantage of the money we are earning for an exchange or whatever to develop our industrial base. So because we are a cheap wage labor economy, we use that in the international market. We use that to sell carpets, we use that to sell vests and t-shirts and socks and stuff like that, you know. Uh, and that is why we are depending entirely increasing on, on informal one, one, one last one. Foreign direct investment, which is the kind of investment I really want, because foreign institutional investment is the kind that can easily go away. FDI is more you know, permanent in some ways, because you you actually are participating in the in the organization and running of the firm. FDI, which is to be quite huge for IT, about 21%. Do you know how much IT gets now? Four to five percent. And where the increases happen, 22% in real estate and construction, the place with informal labor is in buckets. You know? So even the MDI people realize that that's where the money is. So it's very sad, unless somebody breaks that vicious cycle, it will be very difficult to come out of it. Uh, so the other thing there is also the discussion of hope, which we all call is hope about. And especially uh, what the two cases you didn't say for the decades of the private school, you know, you said that I was a lot of money. What kind of hope do they have to the kids to get in that education in the private school? Partly because the nature of private school is very different. So when my parents went to school, if you went to say Don Bosco in California, I mean, Don Bosco or any of these other kinds of schools, not out of here, there was a certain expectation, a certain orientation of where in society they would fit. Now, a lot of schools have been afraid of going to teach in English, but then the argument is that the quality of education is also very questionable. It's not just in private schools, even in universities, but a lot of state universities in India have also suffered a kind of investment. Um, people I knew who went to state universities, and they were usually very prominent town in the world, were saying actually that if they didn't agree, they still won't be able to compete, let's say, someone studying from the university level. So there are these kind of questions. So, what kind of quote do they have with the, with the way education is also changing? And uh, the last question is, we are looking at agriculture, looking at the sort of situation we're not looking at agriculture. So how, have, how has agriculture sort of changed? Okay. Um, school. It's like this. That, you know, uh, people hold out hopes up to a certain point. And then, if it doesn't really materialize, they become cynical or become disheartened and look for something else. Right now, and this is what I fear the most, because as, as I told you earlier, little less than 57% of the unskilled worker is school degree. And about 20% plus 21% have a PE or graduate degree. It's certainly not good news. It's not an incentive, you know, to study in hotel. So right now I think we have to well, think of various ways of actually making the more effective and work. But for the time being, most parents are still hopeful that education will see them through this you know, period and their children will have a better future. Uh, contrary to popular belief, rural poor are a very adventurous sort. They send their children far away to work and they don't actually cry around the club like middle class parents do. You know, they want the children because they know that that's the only way they can survive. And they take enormous risks. Education is also a big risk that you You know, education for most of us is an everyday affair. You have a child, child in a school, you know, so bother, you could find, find the school, bribe somebody. But for these people, it's a risk. It's like, almost like a venture, you know, uh, entrepreneurship. And putting in this money, earning money, in my child's education. The sad part is, the Indian Human Development Development Report, which was done in conjunction with the National Council of Applied Economic Research, they found 
that conductance with little of 50% of case could not compute a simple arithmetic calculation or recognize the sentence like my mother's name is Moti Ben when they were in class 3. Little of 50%. In private schools, such as they are, in different quality or whatever, it is 30%. It's still 30%. It's a lot. You know, 30% is a big risk. So at the end of the day, you know, it's too bad that your child could easily fall in 30% and not learn much. Because those schools are not really great schools for being in those schools in the villages. But on this, we can have a set of discussion on health and education, which is very, very frightening. Your last question was about um, you see, treating their agriculture. Today, very as it were, the amount of land devoted to food crops has gone down by about 10 percent for the last four censuses. You know? uh, among devoted to pulses has gone down by two to three percent. The amount of land to non-cash crops has obviously gone up. What is sad is cereals and coarse grain. That has taken a beating until we were up to about 10 percent. The rice has remained more or less constant. Okay? Now the thing is this, that you would imagine that because coarse grains are easy to grow and require very little tending to, you know, they're hardy. Uh, more and more people should grow that and then you can eat more and live and live well. But instead, you're growing things that are really meant for the market, which is wheat and rice. Why is that so? Because most small farmers, are actually net purchasers, not net sellers. So they sell their grain to be able to buy things like soap, clothes, this, that, and the other, which would not be the case if they were to buy to sell or grow coarse or seeds. There's no way they can buy coarse seeds. Which is also why a large number of farmers today, I don't know about my cotton study, which I really enjoyed a lot, was stuck going while I was doing it, but I looked back and I'm very happy I did it. We went to a full set of six states of India and two of Pakistan. And I found that these small farmers, the risk takers, but they invest in cotton. Till 2001, they did not do it because the, the American board view that the pest, you know, eating that cotton. The BT farming, that crop was resistant to this kind of pest. So they went to the cotton farming with engines. And cotton farming, as you know, requires a high level of inputs. Of course, the amount of pesticides is lower, a third lower, quite a bit actually, from the other cotton. But other things are there. But if your crop is successful, it's a bountiful crop, and you made it. You can pay off all your debts. But if your crop is not successful, you had it. And you find that all the suicides take place primarily in cotton districts. Primarily. Not for you. For example, in Punjab, in Sabur. In this Russia, we can go to Abu Al Fasaka. This is the area where you have uh, suicides. Amravati, Yodhamal, in Maharashtra, you know, and places like that, where poor farmers with hardly any back backup in terms of infrastructure go in for cotton, make it very happy, go in for cotton, dig away next time, make it very happy, go in for cotton, and much bigger than third time, sunk. And you know who they borrow money from? Most of the farmers that commit suicide borrow money not from the money lenders but from formal credit sources. Formal credit sources you know, actually are the reason for, for sort of, how should I put it, precipitating a suicide state of mind to commit a suicide. Because the formal uh, credit sources they don't listen to all kinds of persuasions. You know, if you take money from the informal credit, like say the man who supplies you with seeds, then you cannot pay him this year, he's going to pay me next year. In the meantime, he sells you seeds, he already makes up for it a bit by selling them at a certain price, which is higher than the usual price. So there's not a give and take. But when the formal source of credit, the bank employees come and the white ambassador come, park it out so the village, come and say, hey, Ram Gopal Khan hai, and the US is there, Maha hai, and the whole crowd behind you, and you go there and you spot his house, abuse him, abuse his children, and you stop or say, I'm going to come tomorrow, and if I don't get it, this is what, you know, makes situations much worse. Anyhow, cash flow has a good side to it, if it does well, 
as others, but you can't now get back. You can't say, I will not do cash flows. Because then you will surely die. You know, you have to do it. And because land size is so small, cash flows are so risky, there has to be some way of supporting agriculture outside of the box in which we are placed in now. And this is so surprising that the last two decades, we haven't really had an agricultural policy. Till before that, we had agricultural policy. We had the anti Zalimani movement with the Green Revolution. We had Mr. Professor Bhalla and Chatta have worked numerously on how Green Revolution moved from the early land augmentation to mechanical to chemical, you know, and things like that. But now we have no, no policy on that. And things have changed. This is not the old thing, you know, like I told you, the books I read were useless.
So that is one big problem we are not taking care of. Our legal structure is something that nobody has really bothered about. Whatever legal structure we have, we violated it in a number of ways, as we can see in Taliban. The largest source of corruption anywhere in the world is, you know what? Real estate. Because you can buy only so many Rolls Royces and Mercedes. You can buy only so many fur books. But your appetite for real estate is insatiable. So whenever you have real estate which is loosely controlled, you will have a lot of corruption. And in India, where real estate is combined with informal labor, the source of corruption in the corporate world is very, very large. So town planning is in the essence. You cannot have an organization of this sort where things just happen. Nobody takes care of what's happening. And then someone will stand up in politics and beat up others who come from Australia. That's not the way you do it. Because town planning is a serious exercise. In Paris, for example, or London for that matter, they built subways when there were hardly any traffic because they saw things 50 years down the road, what it would look like. There was a town plan. So this is the problem. Why should our cities, why should our small towns be such you know, ragged places to live in? Why do old people live in small towns? Because there are no hospitals. So all the old people are still in the cities, you know, when they should be sitting in a small town in an easy chair, you know, looking at the sunset. But they can't do it. Well, most of us do as much as we can, but I must tell you one thing. Uh, that in our country, in most countries, it is the politicians that hold the key. And unless you are able to do something at that level, what you can do at your level is to put things in the agenda. Urbanization, for example, was Shira Dixit No one discussing it. No newspaper discussing it after one day. It's a, it's a terrible thing. You know? What they're doing in terms of reservations, just to win more votes, is terrible. There's something called good reservation, something called bad reservation. Something called good urbanization and bad urbanization. Only politicians can actually make the ultimate, the last, the, the final uh, difference. But on what you can do is to put it on the table. You keep doing it all the time. Most of us don't do it, we just move on to something else. Um, thanks, uh, Professor for and wonderful lecture. So, initially, uh, my first question is, uh, does Islam in the, uh, in the urban area of India represent the nature of India's modernity? So, this is one question which I pose. If yes, then how could we uh, actually uh, reshape our understanding of uh, modernity, what we have learned, whether the Babylonian notion or coming to Eisenstadt or any uh, theoretical or conceptual understanding of modernity to how to represent it. Secondly, if the, uh, the situation of 2010 or 12 of India and compare with what happened in the 19th century, the high a stage of industrialization in Europe where there was a, a kind of a similar situation where people went from villages, settled in the cities, but the growth and industrialization uh, benefits were not actually uh, reaching those places. So in that context, again I will bring in uh, what you can say you know what Mark said, there was a kind of alienation. So, in your study, have you found from such a kind of situation where you just have felt this kind of alienation? Yeah, first of all, I think I need to uh, clarify one point, and that is everything that is happening today, mm -hmm. because it's happening today, mm -hmm. does not mean it is modern. Yeah. Modernity is different from contemporaneity. Mm -hmm. Contemporary is happening today. You know, modernity is one concept. Uh, I, even if I may say so, I'd like to read a book that I have written called Mistake in Modernity. Mm -hmm. Modernity is a concept, probably the only concept in sociology, sadly, 
which is not based on human relation to other objects. How many smoking chili stacks, how many cars, how many roads, how many slums, etc., etc., how many times. Every other social concept, even capital, even labor, is relational. Because capital is not just money. Capital is relationship between capitalist and labor. Let's say Marx. In labor, power is not just power. Power is resistance to authority. Again, a relationship between people. Modernity is one concept which somehow didn't get that, that, that quality in it. And I think modernity is modernity when we talk about relationship with people. When people look at each other spontaneously and without any excessive uh, thought as equals, that is modernity. But I can change faces with you roughly by and large. That is modernity. But this intersubjectivity, if I say, is Anthony Greenstone. That is modernity. Modernity is not fast cars, not going abroad, not discotheques, not English language. It is how you look at other people, how other people look at you. How a doctor looks at a nurse, a doctor looks at a patient, or a teacher looks at a student, or a father looks at a son. Hegel has said in his very famous work on phenomenology of the spirit that a son, a boy, a child, is a little citizen. He's not your child to step around. Is a middle system. So this is how modernity is built. In our country and many other countries, we see modernity simply in terms of either very expensive items, you know, all in terms of squalor. So the slum today is not a symbol of modernity, it is, it is a symbol of India's informal labor structure, which is a sign of our way of making a quick buck in the international market. It's our way of enterprise. It is not modernity. In my understanding. And when it comes to the second issue of, uh, what was the second one? Uh, yeah. I was comparing with uh, the 19th century. Oh, 19th century. So we look at the 19th century. So let's, let's take Britain, for example. We look at take, take Britain, or you take France, Britain, and Germany, three times, and Scandinavia, and Sweden. You'll find something very interesting. Some of the most far reaching legislations in Britain were initiated not by the people, not by the masses, but by crusty aristocrats. Robert P. Sir Robert P. He issued an anti corn law movement when he was one of Britain's largest landlord and he had the most to lose by repealing the corn law. But he fought against the corn law, he lost his prime ministership, Lord Russell came after that, Lord Russell formed a different party, then Robert B. came back again and eventually the corn law was established. In 1871, Disraeli was the head of a conservative government. And Disraeli was the head of a conservative party. And Disraeli cabinet was full of all these conservative and aristocrats. But in Disraeli's government, they did two or three wonderful things. For example, we talked about slums and, and world living conditions. The Workmen's Housing Act was passed by them. That houses have to be of certain specifications if they have to be passed. And that is the major reason why tuberculosis came down in Britain. Because housing, it's an engineering you know, intervention, not a medical intervention really. It's an engineering intervention. Then you have someone like William Pimsel of the Pimsel line. He was a major coal merchant. But he devised a system by which the Pimsel line, below which if a ship goes, that ship is prone to sink. It went against the interest because the more we loaded onto a ship, the better for his coal, coal uh, uh, business enterprise. But he was the one who went against it. So, Education Act, Health Act, all of these were done by aristocrats. Child labor. Did the people of Britain fight child labor? Ordinary laborers? No. Ordinary laborers said, I worked with a child. My son is no prince of Wales. He worked with a child too. Who fought against child labor? It was the aristocrats and the elite of Britain who fought for it. Who fought for women's rights? Elite women, eminent bankers, elite women, a very elite background, who was having a great time. She lived in Eco Normal in Paris, came back, and she was going to be the, the, the you know, the leading light of Britain's social, uh, so, social circle. She decided to start this thing, and they did the match girl strike. They attacked David Lloyd George's, George's house. Instantly, David Lloyd George in the 19th, early 20th century before the war was the one who started the Insurance Act, which they put together the National Health Scheme. 
the uh, Austria, there was the Red Austrian movement. In this man called Julius Candler started the health movement in, 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 in Vienna, which then became the Austrian health, movement, health sector. In Candler, Tommy Douglas in Saskatchewan, he mentioned Canada, well, you mentioned Canada. Saskatchewan, he started it there. So, it's all about politics. And when this kind of breed of politician will come to our country, I do not know. But I can tell you this much that advances in democracy happened because certain politicians took the lead. So, if that is a kind of pessimism, so what can we see? Kind of, you know, the, the, the optimism is that we never know what will happen tomorrow. <laughs> So is there any chance of class consciousness or what? It is a class consciousness. You see, you have to think of this this way. That what are you doing for people as citizens, which you and I can commonly benefit from? The easiest way of hobbling on the public is saying, I'm looking after the poor. I'm looking after targeted group. As long as public distribution was not targeted, very little food escaped from the money and leaked out. The moment was targeted the middle poverty line, 46% by conservative estimates was leaked out. Which is very important to all kinds of places. NC Sustainer story is the 17.6% of people who are the richest quintile are getting food from the PDS, which is not meant for them by long shot. So whenever you have targeted population like health for the poor, education for the poor, take it from me, it will be poor health and poor education. But the moment you have universal health and universal education, that's a different story. For that to happen, you have to have politicians who think big. Politicians who think small will think of the next election and how to grandstand. All these people who took great chances, they lost their seats. Disraeli lost it, Peel lost it, and Lord Russell lost it, uh, Palmerston lost it, but they fought their ground and it against their class interests. All of them. I'm just giving you some examples and many, many more. Okay, yeah, one last question. Yeah, I just want to take a look at Well, before Modi. When Modi came, 1,000 
185 or 86 villages have to be electrified. All the other villages were already electrified. During Modi's time, the last 100 odd villages were electrified. Modi came the credit for the entire thing. Before Modi, the fertilizer, the, 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 the refineries were set up. Before Modi, the, the uh, ports were set up. Before Modi, the soda ash business was set up. All of them set up not to serve Gujarat, but to serve India. They made money from India. And that's why India supported it. So you cannot think of anything which is only for the region. However, certain things do require special attention. Because a lot of injustice has been done over time. This is take Chhattisgarh or Jharkhand or some of these poorer regions which have suffered a lot because of a number of factors. So you have to have special programs for them, but not to isolate them from India, but to integrate them more meaningfully and profitably with India. I think that is the way we should. Uh, why is it that you have this Maoist movement in Jharkhand and uh, Chhattisgarh? The major reason in my view is that these are areas from where no professor in South Asian University has come from. There is nobody who is from JNU, nobody is from Cambridge, nobody is a movie star, nobody is a Hollywood producer, nobody is a fashion designer has come from this region. Therefore, this region has been opaque to our everyday observation. We are, we are not part of it. Because we are not part of it, two things happen. One is the bad business people get them, the corrupt buccaneers enterprise get them, and, and politicians who are running on the run get them. And when these two get together, the combination can be called I looked at Maoism in Jharkhand, and I wrote about it, I presented it to, to the uh, to gathering where the head of the uh, home ministry was there, the vice president was there, and I told them that I have studied this area, I've been there, I've been to Jharkhand, I've been to uh, four major districts, etc., etc., Palama, and Chhark. And I can tell you that the real problem in this area is not ours. The real problem in this area is indiscriminate, uncontrolled, greedy capitalism. That is the problem. And unless you control that, you can't control anything else. Maoism is, this Maoism is only a small screen behind which all these activities take taking place. Because that is the reason why every politician, every chief minister wants to tell you how bad and how dangerous Maoism is. Because they benefit from it. There will be a few Maoists, no doubt, who are believers, but the bulk of them are with these buccaneers highly invented. So if you want to talk about Jharkhand, you have to think of India. You can't just think of Jharkhand. And that is my view. So I think the sectoralized way of looking at India is not a good one. There are special problems. The special problems have to be seen in an India-wide matrix. Otherwise, there remain a special problem. Like, if, for example, you look at Shedu Kasa, Shedu Kasa, and not as citizens, they will never be citizens. If you look at the poor as poor and not as citizens, they will never be citizens. They remain poor. If you see the minorities, the minorities are not as citizens, they always remain minorities. And that, I think, is something we have to consciously get so you mentioned about the skilled, skilled people for So you mentioned about skills and development for informal about skills, skill development. Skills, yes. Skill development. Exception said to me that 
Ich kann hundert Aktivos und Rechnungen machen. Ein Film wird viel gut. Am Anfang, der Dose bekommt, Regeln werden sie praktisch, don't take them for home, as much as the contract workers do, because the sense of religion is kind of kind of my booster job, you know, keeps them there, and the deep fact, into those that are allowed to be. So it is not the people themselves, the what are the Maruti uprising all about? It is because they have said that make us regular, or make everybody contract, because the difference in skills between a contract worker and a permanent worker is zinch. The difference in pay and security is a lot, which is what hurts. If you're a regular worker and your skill levels are very high, it's fine. But if you're just like me, and you've got and you're a favorite pet dog or something, then I don't like it. If you're a glass blower, for example, and you find a little bit of a a glass blower, a glass blower job is pretty very skilled. And a glass blower does not want a regular job. Because he's looking for the best you know, offer. You know? Otherwise, most people want a regular job. That's what they go for. You know, agriculture. You see, agriculture does best that you were earlier, when fewer people feed more. If they're feeding themselves, that is not a regulatory agriculture. Agriculture is that there should be economy of scale. I mentioned to you about France. What I saw was a small farmer had given the land to a large operator who was not producing on the economy of scale and feeding farms. You know? So fewer people are feeding more people. And that is how development happens in the agricultural front. And that is what we must also try and aspire to. And there are ways of doing it. And if you're interested, you can do it. But right now, it seems to me people are not interested because they're still playing on the politics of the given. This is my given situation. Let me maximize it. Therefore, the group play a role 
in constructing the delivery or educating the delivery other than the provisions in the Constitution regarding reservation. Person than Michael Madhusudan. 
because Krishna has come to us in this relationship with other people as well. The way you treat women, the way you treat widows, the way you treat poor people, you know. As far as Michael was concerned, Michael was saying was, I'm going to break the rules, but it's not a relationship, I'm going to eat beef. You know, this is Michael and this is part of the big model. That I think is a thing oriented, eating beef. But for the student of the Vidyasa, it is how I treat it utterly as, as it will be, you know, that intersubjectivity. And I think it, in Bengal itself, I would say that the popular rendition would be Michael Madhusudan, a modern color figure, and Vidyasa is a relatively traditional figure. I would put it the other way around. I would see Vidyasa as a modern figure, and Michael as a, you know, okay, but not really quite as modern as Vidyasa. Friendship is therefore a matter of choice, we do things without any purpose. You know, that is what friendship is about. We relate to people with purpose. It may be a good relationship, but it's not a relationship between friends. At any rate, I have seen my own lifetime, which has traditionally been quite long and happy, uh, that uh, friendships in the villages have been quite startled and impressed by the friendship I've seen in villages. And what I've also seen in villages is people marrying outside their caste and religion. That's also happening. And because it's happening now, that's why you have all these murders. In the past, nobody did it. So nobody talked about it. Now they're taking the chance. You know, Charan Singh's daughter married a Bariya. And she had been the village. She lived in the city. She never been in the village. Because you know, if you marry outside, you better leave. Don't stay here. Salman Rushdie has said that a metropolitan experience is one where you cannot choose your neighbor. But we can go further and say a metropolitan experience is one when you cannot choose your son-in-law. And when that happens, I think we're really important. suggest that we go outside uh, and this discussion will be more approximately and uh, informally when we have some tea. I hope we have some. Thank you very much.